So welcome everyone um, to the next workshop in our Childhood Neurodiversity Workshop series. Um, today we'll be talking about the impact of early life stress. My name's uh, Dr Annie Bryant and I'm a clinical psychologist working in the Psychology in Schools team um, in Suffolk Mental Health Services. And I'm, and I'm Linda Brindle, um, I'm a senior psychotherapist also in the same team in Suffolk. Thanks Linda. And I'll be taking through the first part of our workshop today and then be handing over to Annie for the second half. Um, Annie's in control of the slides, so I'll ask if we can move on to the first slide, please, which will give us a bit of an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So as you can see on the slide, we're going to be thinking about really what early life stress and trauma is to start with so that we're all understanding what we're talking about. And we'll be thinking about the impact that early life stress can have on children. Um, and then we'll be moving over to think specifically about neurodivergence with early life stress. And finally, that, that key area of how you can best support your children or other children who have experienced early life stress. So I guess um, for anyone attending today who hasn't seen the previous workshops that have been run with the Childhood Neurodiversity Lens, we just want to mention that the language relating to neurodiversity is really a personal choice. And you'll know if you've attended previous workshops that these, this language has been considered before. So the language we're using today that we think is best um, um, fits for families and young people we've worked with is what we're choosing but we're, we're recognizing that our language choices might not suit everyone's preferences who are on this workshop um, so for example we will be using the words neurodivergent and neurotypical if you're not sure what these words mean we'd recommend you watching back the introductory workshop which is now on our youtube channel and we'll post the link to that at the end We'll also be sharing a link to fit a feedback survey after today's workshop. So if you'd like to provide any feedback um, about our, our use of language today, then please do do that. We would really appreciate hearing from you because we want these workshops to suit your preferences and the needs as parents and carers as much as possible. Okay. Um, now this uh, slide is really just a key sort of thing to highlight for you when we're thinking about this this area of early life, life stress and trauma. We know that talking about this topic can evoke some strong emotions in us, either through thinking perhaps about our own children in our lives, or it might be our own childhood experiences. So we just want to highlight to you that if you are finding the topic just too hard to continue listening to just now, then that's okay. Do take a break. As Annie said, we are recording this session and you'll be sent out the recording in the next week or so. So if now isn't the right time for you to stay engaged in this workshop, you can come back to it later. Uh, and likewise, if you find a Slido question too difficult or upsetting to answer, you don't have to respond. We value feedback through Slido, but you need to also look after yourself. So do what you need in that regard today. Take a break if you need to and maybe you also want to consider what you might want to do after this workshop you might want to go for a walk and just get a bit of headspace if you're able to or reach out for a friend or think of another way in which you can just look after yourself after considering this topic that can um, that can draw on a lot of our emotions Okay, so we've already talked a bit about language and this is a slide helping us to focus specifically on this topic that we're thinking about today. So lots of different language tends to get used to describe stressful, frightening or traumatic experiences in childhood. So you might see that a range of different sort of terms that get used on the screen in front of you. Technically, all of these terms have slight differences, but we might use some of these terms interchangeably in today's workshop. Um, but we just want to help you to be aware that th this language is sort of used variably in different spaces. And we'll give a definition now in the next slide of a general idea of what we feel that all these terms have in common, which will be the focus of our topic for today. 
Okay, so what do we mean by early life stress or traumatic experiences? Trauma is the experience of a very stressful or frightening or distressing event or series of events which can result in significant emotional and psychological impact. Various different events can be experienced as traumatic. Um, they can feel very, very different, but they might all still fit under that term. So it could be road traffic accidents, it might be witnessing or experiencing a violent crime. It might be the, having an experience of uh, different forms of abuse from others. And that might be, um, or being caught up also in a natural disaster. So they, these are wildly different things that can all lead to a difficult experience that could cause trauma. Um, trauma. Traumatic experiences can be one-off, like the road traffic accident, or more ongoing, longer term experiences that are repeated, such as might happen with domestic abuse. And I guess lastly, just to say that people can also suffer from experiencing events directly or through witnessing events from other people. But also you can experience a tra trauma through hearing about a traumatic event that's actually happened to others where you're not present. Now, we'll be talking about this a bit more, but it's really normal to be frightened by extremely distressing events. And it's normal to stay frightened for quite a while afterwards. But even if everyone experienced exactly the same event, it would impact each person very differently and lead to very different levels of distress, some lasting for longer than others. And it's not for any of us, therefore, to say whether an experience is traumatic for someone else. Different people will feel and respond differently to an event. Now we know from research that traumatic experiences that happen very early in life, which is obviously the focus of our topic today, thinking of within the first few years, can have an impact on children's development and their well-being, even if the event can't be explicitly remembered. So that's just an important thing to hold in mind as we move forward. OK, so initially, we just really want to be thinking with you about what are normal reactions to frightening events and what um, a sort of trauma symptoms might look like. And then we'll go on to think about the impact of those experiences on, on brain development, on children's outcomes and also something called intergenerational trauma. So that's what I'm going to cover in the next few slides. OK. It's actually quite normal for children who have reactions to being involved in or witnessing or hearing about a very frightening event um, as they try and understand what happened. It can be actually really uh, normal to have some big reactions. And if you look at the slide on the screen, you'll see a whole range of those. So just take a moment to have a look at these different um, different reactions that people can experience after a frightening event. I wonder if you've noticed any of these reactions in your home. I wonder what reactions you're seeing in your young people or have seen. It's quite normal to be upset even for a while after a frightening event, maybe many feelings of anger, sadness, guilt, confusion, or any combination of feelings. Fear can continue though the danger has passed and memories of past experiences can bring with them all the fear and distress that came from the original event for some people. And those memories can get triggered by sounds, smells, situations, or sensations. Um, we know that when helped to understand when their reactions are normal and understandable, children and young people worry less about such reactions. And I guess that's the same for us as parents and carers. When we understand what's normal, we can sort of put down our concerns a little bit or we sort of monitor what's going on. So normal reactions to trauma can impact on every person in a different way. And it's really helpful just to think about these different ways in which trauma can impact. It can impact on feelings. And you can see uh, maybe from some of the points on this slide, um, some people might experience really big emotions. Some children, the fear and anger will be really predominant. 
They might see rapid changes in mood or physical complaints. So there's a huge mind-body link. And we know that trauma often is experienced through the body. Um, normal reactions to trauma will also include how, how your children might be thinking if they've experienced a difficult early years experience. As the mind tries to make sense of events, nightmares can occur and memories can pop up. And children may struggle with concentrating or have heightened sense of alert. They may blame themselves or feel they should have done something different to um, prevent the trauma from happening. So as well as how children might feel and think, it can also impact on their behaviour, of course. And traumatic experience can impact on what a child might choose to do or not do. Avoidance is really common where something difficult has happened. And choosing to not be near things that remind us of the difficult event is really understandable. Um, children might want to play or draw out an event. They might be clingier, have sleep difficulties, um, temporary loose skills such as toileting, and they may be on edge or hypervigilant. And I guess this slide is really just to highlight and really remind us that all these things are very normal reactions that you would expect for children or, and in fact, adults when they've experienced some really difficult event. So I just wonder, moving on to Slido, have you noticed any of these reactions, any these sorts of changes in your child following a frightening event that they've experienced? Okay, so somebody's noticing, yes, they have uh, nearly all of them. Tummy ache and headaches, not sleeping the same. There's some yeses, yeah, wetting themselves again, being more clingy. Yeah, not wanting to go into school. Yeah, so emotions, anger, noticing that some of those can, can continue to go on. Um, yeah, see many of the behaviours with people you work with, okay. That hypervigilance, that being on alert, yeah, yeah, clinginess, big emotions. Yeah, so a lot of people are noticing things that are going on for their child in their bodies. Other people are noticing sort of behaviours and avoidance um, of doing things that perhaps feel really difficult following difficult experiences. And then there's something you're talking about, that fear of other, no adults being around. So is that something about lack of feeling safe that can happen? Yeah. Yeah. Pushing people away. Yeah. It's sort of impacting on how, how your child might manage the relationships which previously were managed okay, perhaps. Um, irritability, anger, nightmares. Yeah. Yeah, so lots, lots of you are, are noticing. Thank you for sharing here um, some some significant changes that you've noticed in your child following um, a frightening event or that early life stress difficulty managing. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing those. This slide is really just to highlight a sort of a trio, which I think very much links into what you have just been talking to of those sort of some what might be seen as some key key symptoms to sort of hold in mind, breaking them down into three different areas. So whilst various responses immediately after the frightening event are quite normal, some people continue to struggle with the emotional and psychological impact many weeks, months, or perhaps even years after the traumatic event. And uh, this is where this trio of symptoms, if, if uh, an event has a long lasting impact, uh, might be really relevant to be paying attention. So hyper arousal, where high levels of anxiety and stress remain. And, you know, you might notice your child has that sort of sensitivity, a greater sensitivity for things, for certain noises. Somebody talked about being really alert and hypervigilant, looking out for, for, for danger. Those are really common 
elements where this sort of trauma symptoms have continued. Avoidance, you talked about avoidance, didn't you? Many of you, of your child not doing things that they were doing before. And this is really common um, that uh, after any difficult event, it's too hard to go there, whether it's physically actually being around where that difficult event was, or actually even mentally, so that we try not to think about the things that are difficult. And I just want to note at this point, this is such a common strategy that any of us might choose to do. But we know that in the long term, that can impact on the body's natural ability to process and work through a difficult event. So we'll come back to that in, in a bit. And, and lastly, the third of the trio points is intrusion. So that, that experience where you can find that your child seems to be re-experiencing an event, a difficult event from the past. So we often talk about that as something like having flashbacks. Or maybe they don't actually experience the whole event, but thoughts or images might pop back into their mind. Or they might have dreams, um, which are also feel like they're intrusive images because they're not about what's going on in the here and now, but it's those memories popping up from the past. So when when somebody experiences these sort of symptoms over a long period of time um, after an event, then that might be something that could lead, if it's lasting long enough, to um, meet a diagnosis of PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and I guess what's important to mention about that is that that's where it's recognised that people's brains get stuck they haven't been able to fully process their memory and move it to the part of the brain that recognizes it as in the past and so as a result of that they are still feeling the same levels of emotional distress that they were when that event first happened and when that is the case it's really good news to know that there are there are really effective interventions that can be um offered to support young people, children, young people, also adults, where they are stuck in that sort of PTSD presentation. And not everyone will meet that, that disorder, but that it's really important to highlight there that it is worth seeking help if you feel that your child is struggling with that area. And obviously assessment needs to be done to find out when's the right time to um, for them to access that help when they're ready to, um, to address that. Okay, so the experience of early life stress and trauma can impact on a child's brain development, depending on what stage of development their brain is in. And depending also on the severity and chronicity of the traumatic experience. So this slide really neatly just helps to make sense of, of this. At the top of the slide, it shows that the earliest part of the brain to develop in the baby is a brainstem, which provides the essential functions for life, such as setting up our sense sensory system, controlling our automatic functions such as our heart beating and breathing. Uh, when significant early life stress occurs around this developmental stage, uh, this may result in difficulties with sensory processing, um, high or low emotional arousal, impulsivity, impaired sleep, unexplained medical symptoms. OK, so that's where there's been something happening at the point of the brainstem developing. The next to develop is what we call the downstairs emotional brain. If that's not a, a term that you're familiar with, I guess it means you haven't linked into the previous workshops that have been offered in this series. And if you want to know more, um, please do go back to um, um, uh, look up the previous brain development um, workshop, which will give you a lot more information in this area. But just for now, we call the downstairs part of the brain. If you look at that image on the, on, on the slide within upstairs and downstairs, the downstairs part is the emotional part of the brain. And that develops next after the brainstem. And, and in that emotional brain, it's the alarm system that kicks off our fight or flight response when it senses danger. It's the part of the brain really responsible for our emotions. So significant early life stress at this stage of brain development can result in difficulties building strong attachments with others. It can lead to heightened emotions and difficulties around managing those emotions and managing behavior. And then finally, the last area to develop is what we call the upstairs part of the brain. And that's that 
thinking part of the brain. Um, we know that our brain develops up until around the age of 25 now. So it's, it, it keeps developing for a long time through adolescence and into early adulthood. And this thinking part of the brain is the most complex, complex clever part, I guess. So life state stress at this stage can result in an impact on those finer skills that are developing, which are around problem solving and creativity and thinking clearly and empathy. So where there's a, um, a problem with the um, uh, difficult experiences impacting on development at that point, it can lead to memory problems, low self-esteem, difficulties processing information that's around sort of planning or retraining or organization organizing information that we receive from all around us can lead to pro memory problems and problem solving as well i guess what's really important is to, to be aware that that the slide that i've just shown you the content can help us to make sense of why your child is struggling in particular areas. And this can also really help guide you as to how you can best support them. So let's go on to this next slide that we've got now in front of us. So research evidence shows us that children who experience early life stress are a, a greater risk of all these difficulties on the screen. So you can see them there in front of us. Relational and social difficulties um, might include um, having difficulty with children attaching to their parents or caregivers. Could be that they have greater difficulty around friendships and relationships, maybe a bigger risk of bullying, things like that. Um, but um, much research over long period of time has also highlighted other impacts that, that can happen um, um, from early life stress and that will include health conditions such as cancer and diabetes and other mental health disorders, a greater risk of, of uh, people uh, getting um, sort of drawn into sort of violence or criminality and also an impact on lower educational achievement. And I guess knowing this is, is, is the reason for us talking about this is because actually knowing these things can help you to best support your child to reduce the risk of those difficulties um, by knowing what things could really help support them if they have sadly had those difficult early experiences. Um, so just before we go on to thinking about how you can help support your child, there's a couple of key last points that uh, we wanted to sort of raise. Um, if you just imagine for a second that a child who through no fault of their own has experienced a traumatic childhood and is at risk of all those possible impacts I just talked about on the, on the last slide to their relationships, their health and education and social life then I guess that child we know will one day become an adult and, and perhaps also a parent. And if parenting wasn't difficult enough in itself, uh, let's just imagine how much more difficult it might be for a parent um, who had just some of those other impacts that we've just talked about, perhaps mental health problems or addiction or financial struggles. Um, what we know is that sadly children who experience early life stress are all, also more likely to have parents who experience early life stress themselves. So again, why are we talking about this? Let's just go on to the next slide and just see. Um, we know that Many parents who are trying their best to parent their children may also be struggling with the impact of their own difficult or traumatic childhood, and that's a really tough place for them to be. Um, intergenerational trauma uh, means that the exposure of traumatic events in a person's life can impact them to such an extent that their child might also be at risk of experiencing subsequent traumatic experiences themselves. And I guess there's some evidence even emerging that the experience of trauma may change a person's DNA, which can bi biologically pass on difficulties. Now, that's really tough to hear, isn't it? But I guess we, we really hold on to the belief that, you know, people do the best they can. 
and they absolutely do and this is is not about blaming anyone but it's rather the opposite that it can be really important for all of us to be mindful that those parents who've had such tough experiences and themselves and then they're trying to parent their own children as best as they can will really need the additional support um, um, themselves as they're struggling with their own trauma, as well as trying to support their, their, their child too. And, and we just wanted to recognise that because these are all things which are impacted with early life stress. And I guess just pulling together what we've been thinking about in the first part of the workshop before we move on to um, Annie sort of uh, giving us that sort of lens of uh, around neurodiversity and thinking about what things you can do to support your child given this information. I guess just to pull it together, uh, we've been thinking about what early life experiences, early life stressful experiences might look like and the impact on them. So we've defined them. We've talked about what are normal expected responses after a traumatic event and also consider the impact that, that, that such an event can have for some children. And so as you look at this slide, um, I guess this is um, helping us to sort of just make sense of the normal trajectory of what generally happens after difficult life experiences. So you can see at the top, we've got that stressful or traumatic experience or experiences. And when that is experienced, we would expect initial reactions to the distressing event, like those normal reactions that we had dotted over that slide early on. So lots of different reactions with different people. You raise the ones that you've seen with your children. And those, as we know, can go on for some long time. And that will be normal as part of the adjustment process to gradually um, um, processing that difficult experience. And what we know from this slide, you can see is that on, that on the lower box on the left, we've got that big box that shows adjustment. We know that for majority of people over time, they naturally adjust, their brain does the processing it needs to. And so the memory of the event that was fully sort of always in the head, perhaps right early on in these initial reactions, gradually reduces and becomes less, less predominant. And so what you find is that um, children and young people who adjust will be able to function over time after a period of adjustment with everyday life so they can get on with the other things in life. So we know for the majority of people, adjustment is a natural process that happens, but it does take time. And that's a really good news. Um, now, we also know that some people get stuck after a difficult event and seem unable to adjust even over a long period of time. For, the, for those people, they are struggling to function long term with everyday life. And so there's a really significant impact still continuing for them emotionally, psychologically or relationally. And we know that for those people, they might benefit from some help. And depending upon the difficulty, that help might look very different. It might just be some help from help from some some help informally with a family friend, or it might be that something more specific is needed. So I guess we really wanted just to pull together here to make sense of the fact that when there is a trauma, you, it is natural to go on a journey to get to a point of adjustment. Um, but we also know that some will struggle more and need additional support. Is there anything, Annie, it would be helpful just to add to that um, before we move on to um, your your part of the workshop? I don't think so, Linda. I think that was a great explanation. OK. <clears throat> Thanks, Linda. So um, we're going to think a bit about early life stress and neurodivergence, and then I'll move on to talking about how you can support your young people who may have experienced early life stress. <clears throat> so um, as you may have noticed, as we've been kind of talking through the, the potential impacts of trauma, some of those kind of normal reactions and also some of those potential longer term impacts, there can be a significant overlap between symptoms or behaviours that might be associated with perhaps brain changes from early life stress and from um, innate sort of neurodivergent conditions uh, or behaviours. 
And it can be really difficult to disentangle these symptoms and behaviours to make sense of where they might have come from. And you might have come across this if perhaps you've been through an assessment for a neurodivergent condition, perhaps for yourself or for your child. You may well have been asked about whether there's any early life stress or trauma um, in the history as part of that assessment. <clears throat> there might also be that professional services have re recommended support for early life stress or perhaps family support um, to see what challenges remain afterwards before considering whether or not to offer a neurodevelopmental assessment. But hopefully what this diagram also shows is that some children can be both neurodivergent and have suffered early life stress. In fact, there's actually a, an increased risk of a association between the two. So we want to point out really here that um, although these things are really linked, they are not mutually exclusive. So as we've discussed already, experiencing chronic early life stress or trauma can impact on a child's brain development, which can increase the likelihood of neurodevelopmental conditions or learning disorders. However, sadly, we know from a, a really broad um, evidence base that also being a neurodivergent child is associated with an increased risk of experiencing life events which are extremely stressful or traumatic. So, for example, neurodivergent children are more likely to experience bullying. They're more likely to experience perhaps abuse or being taken advantage of by others. You might find it ext it's extremely stressful being misunderstood by others or struggle with trying to be sort of forced into fitting neurotypical standards. Some neurodivergent children experience the school environment as highly distressing and even traumatic, perhaps due to chronic sort of sensory overwhelm, or maybe they feel they're being repeatedly punished or criticised for aspects that are just part of their neurodivergent self. Um, and some children may feel if they have sort of chronic sensory overwhelm, they might kind of develop a kind of ongoing sense of physical pain or physical trauma from not feeling comfortable in their environment. Might also be that a neurodivergent child finds a big transition or a change extremely distressing, perhaps more so than a neurotypical child. So a change such as moving school or an unexpected loss in the family might be much more difficult and traumatically experienced for that young person. Might also be that neurodivergent children struggle so much with social difficulties that those are experienced as traumatic. So perhaps kind of repeated rejection by their peers, I've mentioned bullying already, already, or even just being lonely or kind of particular social misunderstandings that are felt as kind of acutely embarrassing. So when we're discussing early life stress and neurodivergence, we really need to be aware of a vulnerability going both ways. Um, and that really has impacts for how we as clinicians and yourselves as families can think about how to support neurodivergent young people to both protect them from experiencing some of these things and also to support them if unfortunately they go through something very stressful. So we're moving on to how to support children who have experienced early life stress. I'm going to talk about the importance of relationships and the power of language. I'm going to talk about helping your child make sense of their experiences. I'm going to talk about grounding and relaxation. And we'll talk about movement and well-being. And then we'll have some resources at the end for kind of further reading and support if that's something you think you need. So starting with relationships. So you, you will have already heard Linda talking lots about the potential impact of trauma on relationships and trauma that can occur within relationships. But the positive news is that relationships are the key to healing from traumatic or stressful experiences, and it is possible. So the most powerful way for a child to heal from stressful or traumatic experiences in their life is through safe, supportive and containing relationships with the people around them. So what do we mean by that? So a sense of safety. So at a very basic level, a child needs to know that they are safe and they are cared for by the adults around them. For any child who is feeling vulnerable, routines and predictability really help give that sense of safety. And that is especially important for neurodivergent children. So having predictable and consistent routines and rules can help a child to feel secure and feel safe in their environment, particularly if they're feeling vulnerable. Being supportive. So being supportive involves giving your child time and space to talk about what's happened to them. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. 
but letting them talk through what emotions they're experiencing and exploring why. And we're talking here about active listening. So what we mean by that is when your child is talking through how they feel, it's not interrupting and trying not to jump straight into problem solving mode, which is really hard as a parent, but being genuinely open and attentive to just hearing what your child has to say and letting them kind of figure things out and talk through what they've experienced. It's that idea of coming alongside them to support them and understand things from their point of view. And we've talked a lot in this series of workshops about you as champions for your child. So as a parent, you are a champion for your child in a position to understand their differences, their strengths and their challenges as a neurodivergent child and to stand beside them as their champion and their supporter to help them navigate what is an increasingly difficult world. And finally, emotional containment. So what do we mean by that? What we're talking about is a relationship where the child feels they can share their emotions and that might be through their words or perhaps it might be more behavioural, perhaps through crying or through a meltdown or through avoidance. They're kind of communicating some level of emotion. And the idea is that the adult in that relationship is able to handle or hold those emotions for them. It's a sense of acceptance and protection and support for that child where they learn that even if their emotions feel totally overwhelming and confusing to them, at least their parent is there to help hold these emotions with them. It helps that child develop a sense that they, with your support, can cope with and start to make some sense of these overwhelming feelings. And this is not about a parent always knowing exactly what to do with each of their child's emotions. That would be impossible. But the more that you are there for them, just to be open to whatever they're experiencing, to acknowledge how difficult things are and just to be there with them through difficult times, the more contained they're going to feel with their emotions. So thinking about what we've said about the importance of promoting kind of emotional containment or a child feeling held, what kinds of things do you do at home already perhaps that enables a containing environment? Or any thoughts coming to mind as we were we were talking through the previous slide of things that you do at home that find help you find helpful. Or it might be something that you've thought of as a, a new idea, something you're going to try out. A routine, yes. So having having routine and predictability does feel really containing and safe for young people. Quiet space, yep, that's a really nice example. So giving some quiet time. Every day we check in after school about the day. Yeah, a really familiar pattern and just letting your young person explore how the day was. That's a lovely example. Weighted blankets, yeah, that's a lovely example for particularly anxious times. So a really physical way of, of grounding and calming, which we'll talk a bit more about. Empathy, yeah, so, so important. Listening and validating how the child feels completely yeah you might not always have the answer to the emotion but just validating and recognizing what your child is feeling is really powerful that's a great example so open questions about the day like how was your day rather than was your day good yeah so allowing being open and actively listening to how your child's day was whatever that experience was lovely tactile objects are really popular lovely wrestling with mum to show love yeah so lots of practical examples here as well texting her I love her at the end of the day that's a really lovely example so no matter what's happened during the day reminding your child that they're loved that's really lovely plans are flexible and up to their choice and their resources that day some really fantastic examples here and hopefully helpful for, for you as well to see some examples of other parents of what they're finding helpful at home. Giving space when the child is stressed or the adult. Absolutely. Yeah, really important. It goes both ways, doesn't it? An outside space mentioned there. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Really, really powerful examples. So. Healing through relationships is not just about your relationship with your individual children. So what can be really powerful for young people who've been through early life stress is building a community of positive relationships around them. The more positive relationships your child can have with others where they feel safe, supported and contained, the more positive impact this is going to have on their well-being. So you could think perhaps about ways that you could encourage or support your child 
to form meaningful and safe relationships with various people that might be within the family. So perhaps supporting them to, to kind of develop their relationships with other family members. It might be through their community. So maybe they have hobbies or sports that they do or a religious group that they're part of. Just thinking about building a safe network around your child of people who understand them, which is really important with neurodivergent children and people who can be on their team, be champions for your child and who can advocate for them as a community around them. And this will take time. So particularly for children who struggle with social communication or for children who've experienced relational trauma or really chronic kind of ongoing trauma in their lives, it may well be really frightened or resistant to building new relationships. And the power and value of positive relationships can be developed really slowly over time. So it could start with something as simple as their teacher just saying hello to them and noticing them every day at school and asking how they are. It could be as simple as just having a chat with a, another family member once a week just to check in. And that's referred to as the idea of therapeutic dosing. So taking small everyday opportunities to acknowledge and welcome and show an interest in a young person to slowly build those positive relationships in a way that feels manageable to them. And it might be that you also think about kind of dosing the number of relationships. So if your child really struggles with relationships, it could be that you think about maybe one person outside the family that you could help them to build a relationship with, whether that's a key member of staff at school, maybe their sports coach, somebody like that. And then build from there when that feels that they've they've built a safe and trusting relationship, they're going to feel more confident to try building relationships with others as well. So we're going to think a bit about the power of language. So the messages that children hear about their experiences are really powerful because it helps them make sense of what they've been through. It helps them make sense of the world around them. So if a child goes through something really stressful or traumatic and what they're hearing from the adults around them is that they will never be the same again or they'll never get over this or no one's ever going to help then that child, understandably, is going to feel quite hopeless and maybe even quite catastrophic about what their future looks like. But if the adults around a child are using language around hope and bravery and being able to overcome things, they will start to feel more hopeful and more brave themselves. So this might look like saying something like, I know what happened was really awful. It makes sense that you're feeling really scared, but you're being very brave and you will start to feel better over time. Or something as simple as, I'm here to support you and we will get through this together. So I wonder if we could again open up the, the Slido to think about, are there any helpful sayings or messages that you use in your household that foster a sense of hope or bravery, or even just a sense of kind of a can-do approach that barriers can be overcome? And again, it, it might be something you think of that you've not said before, but you might try saying or something that you think your child might like to hear that might help them feel a bit more hopeful or brave. You matter. Yeah, that's such a powerful one. Totally. Every time you do something, it gets easier. Yeah, that's a really nice example. So that idea of kind of growing and growing in confidence and growing in skill with practice, that's a really lovely idea. You've got this. Yeah, that's a great one. Really simple. Um, thank him for his openness. Yeah, we are a team. Well done. Great job. I understand. Yeah, that's really powerful. And thank you for telling me. Yeah. So themes there about kind of just appreciating your young person being open and talking about how they're feeling. That's that kind of real openness and acceptance. That's lovely. I know it's uncomfortable, really difficult, but things can change. Yeah. My teacher at school used to say, good job. You're so brave. Lovely. So ideas about kind of congratulating, but also a lot of acceptance, mentioning bravery. Yeah, super easy now. Yeah, that's a really good, a really good point. So there may be things that perhaps in the past your child thought they could never do or wouldn't be possible. 
and now they can and, and children can forget that they can forget some of those achievements and I think that's a really nice idea of if they're now worrying about something that they feel they can't do reminding them of all the times that they managed to to do things they didn't think were possible in the past that's lovely rephrase rephrasing things with yet yeah that's so powerful so rather than I can't do it it's I can't do it yet that's a great one I think we can all do it with a bit more of that in our lives I'm, I'm going to try and use that a bit more I don't know about you Linda yeah slow down and look up yeah about being mindful and taking time to celebrate progress that's a really lovely example some really fantastic ideas there everyone thank you so much and hopefully again some some ideas uh, for you to take away as well okay so helping your child make sense so when a brain is trying to heal from a traumatic experience or experiences, making sense of what happened is really important for, for a brain to be able to overcome that experience. And making sense of what happens is important because what it does is it allows the brain, as Linda mentioned earlier, it allows the brain to process the experience and store it neatly in a memory part of the brain where there are less of those kind of really distressing emotions associated. So it puts it in the kind of memory storage without that really kind of present, um, uh, upsetting, distressing emotion associated with it. Something that can be important in that process is having an, an ending or a point of safety. So kind of telling your brain and your memories that that particular event or experience is over. It is something that it's in the past and you are able to move forward. So it's kind of letting the, the brain know that it doesn't need to stay in fight or flight mode or survival mode, that there was an end point to that really distressing experience. So it can be helpful perhaps to think um, that might be useful for some young people to have a kind of discussion or just thinking about an ending or a point of safety at which something got better. So spending time with your child, making sense together of what's happened to them and helping them understand that they are safe now is a really, really powerful part of healing. And when a traumatic event um, is experienced, perhaps by the whole family, a common reaction might be for the family to try not to talk about it at all because that feels easier. It just feels too difficult to go there. But actually, children really need help from the trusted adults in their life to make sense of things that are really distressing to minimise the risk of some of those kind of longer term impacts of not processing that experience. So this could involve just talking about what happened. But for some young people, that might not be accessible, either through kind of communication difficulties or just not being able to put words to what happened. It could be you do something more creative, like allowing your child to draw their experience or write a story or use their toys to talk through or kind of play out what had happened. For neurodivergent children, they might need some additional support, perhaps understanding the social aspects of a distressing or a frightening situation. So perhaps having you explain to them why people acted in a certain way in an experience that they found really distressing. But we really want to recognise that there is a very tricky balance here um, for uh, parents and for clinicians of balancing helping children make sense of their experiences and not overwhelming them by talking about things that are extremely distressing when they aren't ready or unintentionally kind of re-experiencing something that's very distressing in a way that only makes them feel more overwhelmed. And that is very, very difficult to do. You know your children best, so you may have a sense of what feels too much and too overwhelming and what feels like you, you maybe could open up a discussion or, or try something creative. Or it might just be really very difficult for you to judge when's the right timing or how to talk about something. There are some books and resources that can help you with this, which we can link to at the end. But it might be that even with your best attempts to kind of come alongside your child and support them and try to make sense of what's happened together, that they still continue to really significantly struggle with things that have happened to them. And in this situation, it might be that you want to seek some further help, which again, we'll talk about at the end. So calming and regulation. So we won't spend too long on this. We've had a previous workshop about managing big feelings where we talk lots more about managing feelings like anxiety, which are really common um, when children have experienced something distressing. But we this slide is from that workshop and we talked about ways of kind of calming and regulating emotions, which can be quite helpful for children when they're working through some of those big feelings associated with a difficult experience. So um, 
techniques that you may well have heard of before. And actually some of you were, were mentioning earlier in terms of what your child finds helpful at home. Um, there's lots of different breathing techniques that your child might find helpful. Um, for younger children, they can do things like what we call balloon breathing, where you imagine you have a balloon in your belly and try and fill it up with breath and, and kind of blow it out. Um, children, you could ask them to kind of lie down and put a toy or a teddy on their tummy and again, fill their belly up with breath as they breathe and kind of take their teddy for a ride on their belly with their breathing. For maybe older children um, or children who uh, kind of want something a bit more um, discreet, you can do things like finger breathing. So kind of breathing in um, as you trace up one of your fingers and breathe, breathe out as you trace down um, or simply just counting numbers of breath. So breathing in for four seconds and out for six. There's loads of different breathing techniques. I'm not going to go through all of them today. Um, and as I said, we've we've talked about lots of them in our previous workshops, if you want to have a look. Um, grounding techniques is something that refers to the idea of kind of bringing people back into the present moment. So coming back sort of to the ground in the present moment. And this can be particularly helpful when children are getting caught up in a in perhaps a memory or thinking about a previous experience, something that's taking them away from the present moment and making them feel quite distressed. So really simple techniques that can bring people back into the present moment can be going outside for some fresh air, just maybe having a look around the garden or outside the house. What can they notice? You know, are there any bugs around or things like that? Could be something like um, asking your child to name all the things they can see in the room that are a particular colour. So you could say, tell me everything in the room that's blue and asking them. It makes them kind of focus on the present moment and what's in the environment around them. Another great example is uh, 54321 senses technique. So asking a child to name five things they can see, four things they can hear, three things they can feel, two things they can smell and one thing they can taste. Smell and taste, if they can't think of anything, you can ask them to imagine something that they really like. They're just all simple techniques of kind of bringing your child into the present moment to kind of get away from being um, drawn into some of those either memories of what's happened in the past or perhaps worrying about what might happen next. And then sensory regulation. We know lots of neurodivergent children have kind of sensory differences and they may well have um, sensory experiences that are really calming for them. So some young people really like perhaps the feeling of slime in their hands or playing with water um, or kind of changes in temperature. So having a warm drink or something like that. Um, some young people really need some kind of physical exertion to help them calm down. So whether that's jumping on the spot or skipping or kind of sprinting or playing football or something like that. Um, kind of noises and music and nice smells and things like that could be really helpful. Again, I'm not going to spend too long talking about sensory regulation. Um, and we are having our, our next workshop next month is going to be about sensory processing as well. But it's just having a think about what are those kind of go to strategies? What are the things that might help your child when their emotions get really difficult? And the final thing we're going to talk about is the power of movement. So research evidence shows us that movement and exercise is a really powerful tool for managing stress and from healing from trauma and stressful experiences. So any movement is good movement. So any way that your child can move their body in a safe and enjoyable way can help them gain a, a sort of sense of control both over themselves and over their environment. It helps get rid of stress related chemicals in their body. So literally getting rid of stress from inside the body. And it helps them give a sense of kind of improving and learning in certain skills, giving a sense of achievement and perhaps improving self-esteem. So it could be that your child loves doing a particular sport and they could try a new sport that they haven't tried. It could be going and skipping outside. It could be running up and down the stairs. It could even be as simple as um, kind of drumming their hands on the table or um, kind of doing some stretching or some yoga poses or things like that. It doesn't have to be high intensity movement, just something that gets your child's body moving and gets them using their muscles and even something really relaxing. And it's even better if movement is something that you can do together as a family, whether that's taking the family dog for a walk, maybe dancing together, could be playing tennis together or playing a game together. 
Um, and movement's really great for sensory regulation as well, as I've talked about. And really simple movement activities can be really enjoyable, really enjoyable sensory experience. So that might be cooking together, like I said, maybe playing with slime, finger painting, rolling on the floor, that kind of thing. So have a think, um, maybe yourselves and with your young person. So what types of movement, this is our final slide over before we go on to some resources, what types of movement does your child enjoy or find relaxing? And again, you might come up with some ideas that other people find really helpful here. Could be a movement that's relaxing, could be uh, soothing, could be a sport that they like. Tickling and clapping, yeah, really nice. Playing catch, great one. Really good for coordination. Playing catch, walking, yeah, walking's fantastic. Really nice thing to do together. Walking can actually make it much easier for some neurodivergent children to talk openly. Walking side by side with somebody is often much easier to talk about how things are going than when you're face to face. Football, loves kicking a ball about, yes, absolutely. Breath work, dancing, fidgets, walking, brilliant, yeah. Throwing bean bags, yeah. Really great examples. Swimming, yes, a lovely one. Yoga pose game, I'm not very good and they laugh at me. That's great, that's brilliant, doing things together, showing that you can improve skills the more you practice, I guess. Brilliant, jumping over waves in the summer, yeah, that's a lovely example. Deep pressure, yes, so lots of young people find that really helpful. Throwing a small ball while doing homework. Yes, great example. So adding a, a small element of movement while doing something that's a bit stressful. Really great examples. Climbing, yeah, another really good one. Wow, so many brilliant examples. Thank you, everyone. I hope you found that helpful as well. So we're coming to the end of our workshop. We've got um, a few resources to talk about, a, a few slidos, and then we've got a... Um, uh, feedback form that you can fill in if you would like and um, so do stick with us if you can so we've got some resources here and um, beacon house is a fantastic um website with loads of different resources about developmental trauma lots of different aspects of trauma um we have put a link to a pdf there particularly about developmental trauma um we will send out all these resources and all these links so don't worry if you can't um click on these links right now there is a page on the Young Minds website about trauma and mental health as a guide for parents. Um, I've put a link to uh, an article on the National Autistic Society website about post-traumatic stress in autistic people, in case anyone finds that interesting. We've put a list of various books there. Um, the first couple are about uh, trauma from some kind of really prominent trauma researchers and then some others about kind of parenting um, and attachment. And then a couple of nice sort of activity books with children. So we've got uh, Karen Traceman's Cleo, the Crocodile Activity Book for children who are afraid to get close. So that's about sort of closeness and attachment. Um, and then the next one, The Invisible String, that's for families coping with sort of separation anxiety or loss or grief. So that's quite a nice book to go through together. If you feel from talking uh, today through all the sort of different aspects of trauma and early life stress if you feel that your child or yourself um, could really benefit from some further support then there's a few different options so you could speak to your child's um, pastoral lead at school perhaps their senko or their class teacher to see if there's some uh, mental health consultation they could access um, from local services you could visit your GP from some advice for yourself and for your family for further support. You can also speak to the Bernardo's Parent Helpline, um, which I put the number for there. So um, that's available for you to talk through any uh, kind of mental health concerns for yourself or for your child. Um, and they can signpost you to local resources. Just to mention, that is a Suffolk specific uh, service. Um, so if you're not local to Suffolk, do have a look at what your local support options are. Um, and then again for Suffolk if you are worried about a particular safeguarding risk um, to your child or your family then then do call customer first the number is there or you can access the web link for uh, live advice 